welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? I'm so excited to share today's conversation. And I know I say that in every episode, but you can't help it when you're talking to amazing people. I met Stephanie during my career transition period. It was one of those serendipitous moments where I asked the universe for a sign and then one thing led to another. Maybe one day I'll share that story with more depth. But it led me to meeting a lot of extraordinary people and Stephanie Major is one of them. She's been on a beautiful unraveling journey in the past couple of years and I'm so grateful she's sharing it with us today. And she also made us a gift for the whole and unleashed listeners. I'm so excited and deeply touched by her generosity. It's a 20-minute guided meditation with the intention of honoring your wholeness. I'll link it in the show notes for you. In the show notes for you. So who is Stephanie Major? She's the Director of Community Success for Archangel, the co-host for The Better with Dr. Stephanie podcast, and a Master Reiki practitioner. Energy is the language she is most fluent in. And she brings that expertise into everything she does to amplify the impact she is making in this world. Finding the safety of a supportive community, dream career, and compassion for herself has propelled her into deepening her relationship with her superpowers and developing new ways to bring this beautiful healing to others. Part of her mission is to guide beautiful souls to reconnect with the vital magic of life through Reiki, energy work, and creative expression. She is committed to her personal and spiritual voyage and invites anyone who feels called to come along. In today's episode with Stephanie, we talked about learning to receive, how healing is not the only thing in our journey, in learning forgiveness and growth after trauma, leaning more into her feminine energy, her spiritual journey back to herself, the type of Reiki she practices, her experience trying quiet meditation for the first time, and her number one grounding tool. It's a good one. Come tag along and enjoy our beautiful conversation. I'm so excited to record this. Thank you so much. Honestly, also thank you for your meditation. Like when I saw the email, my heart was like, what? Thank you. Thank you. I'm learning to accept help, to receive and the fact that you just offered this super generous gift, yeah. and then I meditated and I I sobbed, Stephanie. Aww. It was so beautiful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I just you. I'm so glad you're learning to receive because it is so lovely to give people gifts. So I'm so glad that you received uh, it. Thank I can't you. wait to share it with everyone. Aww. Thank you. I I did it again yesterday and it just, yeah, thank you. It's the most beautiful guided meditation and it just, I could feel your energy there. I, it's my favorite. Amazing. It's, it's a new thing for me to do the guided meditations. I, um, I actually don't write anything ahead of time. Like I went on your website and looked at a few things and like the word home was coming up. And then I just, I put either sometimes put a cover over my eyes or, um, just get really dark in here and I just put the mic near my mouth and I just let it, let it come flow. out. Oh, the energy was beautiful. So oh, thank good. you. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Your room is gorgeous as well. I love all those lightings in the ambient. I'm like a feeling person. So I need like my, the environments that I spend a lot of time in have to just be and feel like me or have like they need a specific purpose so that so that I feel more myself and I spend so much time on zoom like my entire day is on zoom so 
I just decided to create a space that kind of showed my personality and like when I'm seeing it in the background, I'm reminded of certain things. So yeah, thank you. Oh, how did you learn that you're like a feeling person? <laughs> I think it's because when you're in the wrong environment, it's so clear. Like I've never, I've never been an overhead light person, like schools, any kind, anything that had a lot of, um, um, like fluorescent lights or overhead lights. I'm not really it, like, it doesn't please me or it would overload my senses. So if I'm in around environments that aren't pleasing to my senses, I can get like a hangover from it so for me it's like lighting has to be perf like set yeah. and um the intention of a space needs to be set and i can just feel the difference when i'm in those settings rather than a setting that has like more like artificial light or or just um like colder kind of energy. So I just like to set the mood. It's like something I do every single day. Like in the evening when I'm done work, I change into like evening mode. So it's the different lamps go on and the lights maybe oh, get a little I bit lower. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've never, I think I've noticed I like warmer lights overall. Mm. And I think maybe mine is sounds. If there's a lot of sounds, I get yep. easily distressed. And there's construction right next to me. <laughs> so now that I'm spending time at home all the time, this is the only thing I hear. And I, I'm like, I'm going a little bit crazy. <laughs> yeah, and it helps me flip from like, like my morning routine, which I'm very intentional with and I take a lot of time with, has like a certain setting to it. And then when I get in this seat and it's like work mode, I have a different setting. And then it like switches. Oh. So it allows my brain to switch from like my morning routine to work me and then another transition into like evening me. I'm going to use that yeah. in my life and see if sure. it works because it's so hard to transition, especially with cell phones. You yeah. might be working all the time or you might be connected to people all the time. So yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah. I'm trying that out. I'm trying that out. Okay, do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll feel like whenever I start getting the evening stuff ready or, or set the way that I like it, I can feel my body just start to immediately relax and be like okay it gets into evening mode and and right. just like self more self-reflection and it's not the who needs me what do I have to respond it's not like work mode me that right. yeah 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 so you play a lot of different roles mm -hmm. we met a couple of years ago when mm -hmm. I was kind of like transitioning out of my job and I've also seen that you've been through quite a transition tell me <laughs> about <you>? it <laughs> what oh. have you been up to yeah, so we met, what do you think it was, five years ago? Four years it ago? It feels like, but it's three years ago. It was 2017 when I, like, resonated my job. But it feels like five, ten years ago almost. Like, we've had such, a, like, a lifetime within that time. Yeah. yeah. It's been so fun to watch your transformation. I've loved all forms of you and every step along the way. And I've always seen you even you three years ago I still see I saw the you now then um yeah. so uh, I just want to tell you that um yeah it's been a crazy couple years I mean my life is just an interesting story so this is just like the, the phase of my of my story right now it's just the chap the last three years the chapter has been a really like a healing and expansive journey and um, at times very uncomfortable and at times very exciting. Um, where do you want me to start? What part do you want me to start with? Like the spirituality, the career stuff? Um, I guess when did the shift happen for you or when that you felt like it was happening? Yeah. Um, I don't know the exact moment. I feel like my entire life has been steps leading towards where I am now. So I, it did not start three years ago. Right. It, it started, it's always, it's like. It's, December 5th. Yeah. This is the moment I decided to change it. That's true. <laughs> I've always been someone.
someone, and, and this is a, like a, like I'll give myself a little pat on the back, but anytime that something is no longer for me or it's not serving me or for it's not for my highest good, I've always given myself permission to move on from that space. So even before I moved to Toronto, I was living in California and I knew that I wanted to come back to Canada. So for me, I didn't know where I wanted to live. So I flipped a coin between uh, Toronto and Vancouver and I landed on Toronto. So I ended up here about six, five, six years ago, just like on a chance, on a whim. And it's been such an amazing blessing. When I met you, I was running with my dear friend, Dr. Stephanie, a functional medicine clinic, big, big on chiropractic in downtown Toronto. And what a fun space it was. Like it was, it was kind of what I needed at that time. I was still trying to figure my life out. I was sick, tired. And then um, Giovanni ran an event that an Archangel event that was right next to the office. I'm like, what? This is where I work and the event is there? There's a chiropractor office? Because you were kind of hidden. It wasn't like yeah. super, like we yeah. are like a functional medicine. I didn't even know there was <laughs> like a healing place there. So I started going, I'm like, I can use my benefits. And then even after my benefits were done, even after I quit my job, mm -hmm. I kept coming back. It was yeah. sort of like helping me come back to my body that yep. I've push through so much well that was a big thing for me so I had never had chiropractic before and when I met Dr. Stephanie that's when I was introduced to it and for me I've had a lot of physical abuse in my life and when but but a lot of time had passed and I was very in my masculine and I was like no I'm good I'm strong my like I've overcome and yeah. when I started getting chiropractic work done on me and I had that first adjustment it was so clear how much more healing and how much more emotion was trapped how many more memories and feelings were trapped inside of my body it was undeniable like the first adjustment I ever had I I sat up and she said what how are you feeling and I it just burst out crying and I was like emotional and so that was a big part of that was a big part of it because I'm like, okay, there's something here. So going through chiropractic uh, really helped with that, and um, I'll give my daughter Haley credit for my spiritual journey because I grew up very Catholic, and I had felt um, very betrayed by that religion. Very, very spiritually hurt by God, not understanding a lot of the concepts or a lot of ways that spirituality or religion was presented to me. And I very much closed off that part. And I was no God, atheist. I don't believe in anything. And the kids were very aware of this. But my daughter Haley started um, to go to the Jewish club at school because her friends were allowed to invite a friend to come to the club. And so she told me, she's like, oh, my friend invited me to the, to the Jewish club and I'm going to go. So I'm like, that's great. A couple months later, she's still talking about it. And she was still going, like she kept going. And I was like, it's really interesting. What is it? What is it about this club? Yeah. She's like, you know, mom, I just really like the community and I like the culture and I like the rituals and I like how they talk about certain things and I find it fascinating and interesting. And there were other moments in her life too where she would like borrow a Bible from someone at school and like hide it from me and read it. So <laughs> with this Jewish club and how much she loved community and rituals, I started thinking back to all the things that in the religion that I did like and how much I liked at the end of the day before going to bed, like talking to God and yeah. just believing in something bigger than me. And so I started getting curious about God again and going, okay, well, how can I have that back in my life? Not through religion, but through my own practice. Like what would my, what would my relationship be with God if I could create it? Yes. So then I started 
just exploring that a, a little bit and listening to a little bit more spiritual music and, and talking to people about their own spiritual practices. And I just started to connect with him or her. I, I believe we're all God. It's all in us. It's in everything that we are. So, but I just started making it a really big part of my life and and then meditate you know and you just go down yeah. like little rabbit holes and then yeah. meditation became like a huge part of it and um then I started getting interested in energy work and learning the practices and going deep and like all the way until like got my master's in Reiki and energy yeah. work and so it's really just been a lot of different layers and like the next step will find you when you're ready it'll all kind of lead you down this path and the spiritual awakening happened the deep spiritual awakening the releasing of like deep pain and emotions and who i thought i had to be kind of happened about a year and a half ago and it was really painful and if people look it up you can look up dark night of the soul and there's all these like physical symptoms that are happening and you're questioning everything that you're doing and I sunk really deep down into that and was that kind of a result of being more open to the spiritual yeah. work yeah and the energy so whenever you go through the different levels of of becoming a reiki practitioner you get something called an attunement and it, it there's some really deep healing that happens and i'll i'll i remember my even my first session like my first time going for a weekend training and I had been meditating for years before that, and my medita um, my sorry, my Reiki teacher, she said, uh, "Okay, who here has like a meditation practice?" And I was like, "Me, I meditate all the time." And I was, you know, my ego was just like bursting with <laughs> pride of like the meditation that I do. And she was like, "Okay, great. What kind of meditations do you do?" And I'm like, oh, I, med I meditate to this person and I do guided meditations and I do this. And she's like, okay, when do you meditate in silence? And I'm like, um, never, <laughs> no time. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's something to that. She's like, she's like I, I just invite you to spend some time meditating in complete silence and just be alone with yourself and alone with your body and see what comes up. Jessica, that like blew my life up because I attempted it. And when, you, when you're really quiet and you are courageous enough to like ask your body what it's feeling, it yeah. will tell you so many I sat like I did it and like I just bawled because there were so many things that were coming up but we fill our lives with like so many sounds and senses and distractions was there any like cues to get you started because it, it's come up for me like a couple of times now like do you meditate in silence I'm like sometimes but it's just like you know my thoughts I don't know where to go like, I can inspire I can go here and there so how do you even go about meditating in silence yeah. do you just sit comfortable and yeah yeah for me I, like I still remember that the, the exact day that I did it for the first time I, I for some reason chose a spot in my house that I like never have meditated in before <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if I was like okay this is something new I need like a new invite I'm okay this is cre I'm creating something new and I sat, lay down in front of a window and I just got, I just didn't have any music on. There was nobody home. And I closed my eyes and just said, okay, this is my attempt. And then I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I'll like it, but I'm just going to give it a try. And I did. And my body spoke to me and I started hearing uh, certain memories or past versions of myself that needed needed to be loved and needed to be heard and and so it started giving me clues of like okay this area needs more healing or this area um needs more love but also oh you have this passion or maybe you want to do this like it wasn't just about healing it was also about purpose and desire and um, things that I wanted to create or different parts of me that wanted to be expanded. 
So that was a huge part. And then every through all of my Reiki and energy work training, it was essentially just one large healing process. Mm-hmm. which you then realize is not really <laughs> healing at all. It's only just being more of yourself and allowing yourself to expand. And that that's my practice with people. It's I don't believe people are on this planet to heal. I, be, I know that we are meant to be and to be more than we think is possible. So healing is a part of it, mm-hmm. but it is – but it's, it's not huge. where the journey has found me. Yes. Like, and that's why I love that your podcast is called Whole and Unleashed because so many years I, I would have bet all the money in the world and sworn on anything that I was broken. But the truth is we are never broken. We are born whole and we remain whole even through those most challenging times. Yeah. yeah, you said that in a meditation and I, there were so many moments I felt broken and lost, but we're not, even though we feel lost, we are not broken. It's part of our journey. Yeah. And I love how beautifully you put it. Like it's a, it's not a journey of healing, healing. It's part of the journey mm-hmm. so you can become more you yeah. and it's basically that. And I think we share very similar journeys where we're just becoming ourselves and owning our voices, which for me, it's taking years to understand that I wasn't speaking my voice. I guess to give people a little bit more of context about who you are, where you came from. So you were in California. How did you get to California? What took you there? Are you originally from Toronto? No. And so I'm from Ottawa. And um, I had been going through a period where... Um, Oh, my life is such an interesting journey, but I had been going through a period where I just wanted something completely different. And I had found myself in a life that I had created that was for everybody else and not myself. I I woke up in a life where I was going oh, this, this this is what I thought success would feel like. And this is what I thought would make my father proud or make this person proud or I thought this is what I had to be and so so what was the situation like how old were you do you remember the exact moment yeah I was um I was probably my late I was I think I was 29 or 30 Mm -hmm. and I uh, maybe a little bit younger than that maybe 28 or 29 and I had just I had had my kids early on in my, I had my first daughter when I was 20 and my second daughter when I was 21. Mm -hmm. And it was um, with a man at the time who was just not capable of, of loving me in the way that I deserved. And um, so it was a process of like leaving that situation. And, And we can talk about that a little if you want, but it was an abusive situation. And I'm very careful how I talk about it because like myself, everyone is allowed and has permission to be a different version of themselves in, in a lifetime. So I'm very mm-hmm. cautious and I have come to a place of, of, of forgiveness for him. So I, I tell the story I tell the story because it's an important part of my story, but, but there is forgiveness at the end of the story, there is forgiveness. So I just want to make that clear. Um, But I had come to a place where it involved being in a woman's shelter and being on low income housing and having two kids at the age of 21, um, a newborn and a one year old on my own and then going through PTSD and then putting myself through school and raising the kids. And I had put myself through school and I had went through um, to become a nurse. And I mm-hmm. love people and I love healing. And I thought, oh, this is such, this is a job that if I can accomplish it, like people will be proud of me. People will think that I've like made something of myself. And if I can purchase my own place and if I can find someone to love me that is like, perfect on paper. Well, then everyone will look at me and I'll be a success. So I went along those steps and I got very into my masculine and I was like, 
this is all the things that I'm going to do so that I can love myself so I can be something. So I did all those things and I yeah. accomplished them. And I remember the moment and it, a lot of it always ties back to our parents, but I, I re had remembered when I had purchased like a, um, a condo and it was finally built and I had so all those, your, your hard work. Yeah. Basically I, you lead, you mentioned leading onto your masculine energy and a part mm -hmm. of me wonders like, you needed to back then. Yes. You needed to yeah. survive. You needed to, you know, raise your daughters and also support yourself through school. That's yes, not yes. easy. Right. <laughs> yeah. So anyone, like I forgive myself for getting into the masculine because it drove me forward. Like I have compassion and love for every step along the way, but I thought that everything, I thought that my father seeing my place and seeing my life, like I pictured this moment that his face would be like, she did it, my daughter, like I'm so proud. And I remember the first time he ever walked around my place and there was like zero expression. It was like as if he had walked into any place I ever had. And that was the moment where I went, I am not living my life for me. I am living my life for other people. So I sold everything that I own and me and the kids moved to California. <laughs> and we were, I, yeah. <laughs> And so we lived out in the desert in California um, before I flipped my coin and made my way back to Toronto. Was there a reason why California? I mean, I just wanted something that was so completely different than I had ever imagined. Like, you can't get much different between a desert <laughs> and Ottawa. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and then Toronto. <laughs> Yeah, I oh, I missed Canada so much. Like I, I don't know if you have if you have that like attachment to this country, but there was something I was like, I want to go home, but I'm not mm -hmm. sure where. So I'm just going to trust that the universe knows and the coin's going to lead me and Yeah, so so then um yeah, so then I was here in Toronto. Mm -hmm. In Toronto, yeah. Um I think you shared um either in one of your blog posts or I think in another podcast, how, while well, you were, you were a nurse in California and no, that's when I was in Ottawa before I uh, went to California. Ottawa. Mm -hmm. So that's when you had your first introduction to Reiki. Was it then, or just the idea of mm. what Reiki is? Yeah. Oh, when I look back on nursing, I felt like that was like, um, you know, we have like love heartbreaks, but this was a career heartbreak for me because I think that we can go into professions thinking, oh, this is magical. You're healing people. You're helping people. I'm going to change their lives. And I ended up doing some extra education and working in the OR. Oof. And what I start really quickly realized is that everybody that was coming in had like lists of surgeries and lists of medications and like health problem above health problems. So we would bring them in and the OR can be a very cold place and it almost becomes like working on a car because the person is completely covered and you're just like working on their body, but you're sent and then you just send them off and to recovery and you don't see them again. It's the next person that comes in and it broke my heart because I thought, are we teaching people to be well or are we just patching up people when they're sick? And I started getting really resentful over the, um, the whole business of keeping people sick. And I just did not, it did not, um, it's just, it didn't fill me like I thought it would. So, but, but during that time I had met a um, more senior nurse and she pulled me aside one day and she said, she's like, I want you to know that you have very healing hands. And she's like, that is a very special gift and not every single nurse has this. And I want you to know that about yourself so that you can be intentional with how you use them. But that moment made me feel so good. It made me feel like, wow, there's power. There's power in my touch and power in my hands and power in the way that I'm healing people. And I completely put it out of my mind and didn't even think about it. Yeah, because what does it mean when somebody yeah. just tells you I know, something? Right? I was like, yeah. okay, like, cool. Like, <laughs> great. <these> little, <laughs> yeah. I'm good at my job. <laughs> yeah. But this is, this is where it looks like 
you don't know where the clues are going to happen, but that was a clue because a couple of years ago, I was talking to a friend and we were talking about moments that brought us joy. And that moment popped up for me. So I just told him about it and I said, well, this nurse told me that I had healing hands. And he said, have you ever heard of Reiki? I'm like, well, I've probably heard about it, but I don't really know what it is. And he explained to me what it was. So, you know, you can connect all those dots, like looking back, but if I would not have had that little moment of the healing hands, I would have never said it to him and he would have never said, hey, what about this? And he yeah. introduced me to the teacher who taught him Reiki and she's just, she's just been the most wonderful, perfect spiritual mentor to me through that whole process. So that's how, that's how I ended up finding out about Reiki and who to go to and who to learn from. And, um, so what a, is Reiki? I know, right? Okay. Yeah, what is Reiki? <laughs> so the type of Reiki that I do is an, it's called Isui Shiki Ryoho. And it pulls from both Japanese and Tibetan practices. So the Japanese side of things is very golden, very soft, very loving. And the Tibetan practice is very shamanic and kundalini and fire and passion. So it's th those two things put together, which for me, I'm just like, oh, it's so perfect. I, lo I just yeah. love that combination. Okay? I, think I, I think I am a little bit of those. So um, I love that. And there's four principles to it. There's like the healing part of it. There's the spiritual discipline part of it. There's the personal development. And then there's like a little bit of the mystic, which is the connection and the purpose part of it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's healing. It's healing, but it's also, there are parts of it that are healing, but there's also parts of it that can amplify your different chakras. So there is a healing component. I'm very, I love that part of it, but I want to also say that it's very, it's also very amplifying any of your gifts, anything that you have that's in your body. Um, there, it can be done two different ways. It can be done in person. So that is, that is someone who is laying down in front of me with their eyes closed. They can be in a meditative state. That's how I uh, recommend they do it. And then it's just me with my hands over different parts of the body, using different symbols, different intentions, um, going along their body. And it's, it's very gentle, it's loving. It's not anything that's coming from me, it's healing that's coming through me. So it doesn't take any energy. It's not like I'm like, ooh, exhausted after that. You know, it's, it's an energy that is coming through me to another person and removing blocks and, and blocks aren't bad things. Blocks are just part of the human experience. That's why I'm like a little cautious with the healing part of it because yeah. it's not um it's not something I'm trying to fix. It's just something that I'm like energy that I'm moving around in order to release it. And ultimately it's the person that I'm giving Reiki to that has to make the choice to release something. It's never me. It's, it's your own body and your body knows where, how to heal and how to be, how to be whole. So there's that part of it. And then I also do distance Reiki, which is a, a part of the practice that I very, like I love. Um, and that is the person is at home. I'm at my home. We're not on the phone. It's not done on the computer. I like to provide people with playlists that they can listen to and they get into their own space. Uh, it can work if the person is doing other things, but I always recommend like give, your, give yourself 30 minutes and just lay down with the intention to receive. And then on my end, I am like, just being a little witchy Reiki master <laughs> and I'm like setting up a little crystal grid and I have a little notebook and I have um, different little crystals that I use and I connect to 
their energetic field. And because there is really no time and space and we're all connected, I'm able to just like tap into their energy field and give them the same type of Reiki experience that I would if they were just in front of me. Um, I also have additional gifts that I, that I have that I use <laughs> in my practice. And that's just when I'm tapped into someone's energy field, I get visuals and messages and whispers and ideas. And so I kind of experience all of those things. And at the end of the session, I put on my voice record and I let whatever is there come out. And I just speak to them for usually about 20 minutes. And I give them the status of all of their chakras and how they responded to Reiki. And then I give them all of those visuals and messages and any emotions that I felt or um, um, temperature changes or I just give them a whole explanation of what happened on my end and then I send it to them because I feel that when I'm able to just get it all out it comes out much clearer and much um, just more, more fully than if I'm having a conversation with them back and forth Kind of like a clean download of everything yes. you just experienced. Yeah, and I'll tell you something fun about that. So the voice recording one time, this um, one of this beautiful woman that I did a session with, she messaged me. She's like, oh, my gosh, the recording, I can still sort of hear it, but not very clearly. I was like, okay, wait, it's still here. So then I re-recorded a whole yeah. new thing, and it was the exact same time as the first one it was like 20 minutes and like 23 seconds and I sent it to her she's like you know what's so creepy she's like <laughs> they were essentially the exact same messages but this the one that the audio like the, was more clear and working so I don't know what it is but it sticks with me for a bit and then I'm just able to get it out I'm sure if she would have asked me the next day I would have been like mm, I don't remember I can't right. give you that download but it was still there. So then I sent it to the person and they're able to reflect on it because some of the things that I see are very personal and very intimate. And I used to be really self-conscious with the things that would come up and, yeah. and really careful on the timing that people need to hear things. And yes, I, the timing. The timing. I mean, yeah. yeah, sometimes you might, you know, you might see someone and you know what they need, but if they're not ready to receive it, yeah. then... And to be that catalyst for something that someone is maybe avoiding or hasn't, isn't ready to hear, it's, there's a big responsibility in, in being that catalyst, but I'm learning to trust that it's not for me to decide how they respond to that message it came to me for a reason and all I do is lovingly say it in a message and then I release attachment to what they do with that information because I'm just trying to empower them with what I saw and what I feel and then I trust that they know what's what's best to do with that information so now I just like okay I'm just gonna let it all out <laughs> yeah and um and then I really like to empower people with ways to keep their chakras healthy in between sessions because there's things that we can be doing all the time. And so I'll come up with specific recommendations for them. And then if they need a, a telephone conversation, then we can have one. But yeah, that's pretty much how the process works. It's, it's so beautiful. I it love it. It is. I feel a little bit of chills because mm. I can imagine the first time you ever felt all these emotions like what do you do with it like yeah. is it real am I imagining it like oh how did it feel <laughs> okay I would have sessions and then I would I, 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 because I work during like during the day that can often happen usually you know between like 8 and 9 p.m and so I'm sending the voice the voice note to the person but it'll, be, it'll often be that we'll only connect the next day so I used mm -hmm. to go to bed thinking like what if this was the most horrible session? What if they were like, what, why did you say that? What did you do? I'm like, what if I'm just crazy and I didn't feel anything? <laughs> and then the next day I would get a message from them and it would be, 
so deep and so loving and so appreciative and they would tell me the moments that really spoke to them and after so many times of hearing like so many like hearing that so many times I'm like okay you don't have permission to doubt this anymore (laughs) like you just have to just accept that it is what it is. And, and so I don't go to bed anymore, like wondering like, Oh, like, how did that go for them? And now I just, I just come to a place of trust. Of trust. Yeah. It's also part of your, your growing journey as you Mm -hmm. kind of embrace more of yourself. So we talked about it at the beginning, you play a lot of different roles. What are some of the roles that you play right now? (laughs) Okay, well, I'm a mother to two teenage girls, so that is an interesting role. And then we talked about being a Reiki master and Reiki practitioner and intuitive guide. So that's a big part of of my day. And then I'm also the director of community success for a beautiful company and and community called Archangel. And it's just a bunch of heart-led entrepreneurs that are on the journey to change the world and achieve their epic missions and very passionate and in guiding them and assisting and helping them achieve those achieve those dreams and I do coaching within our business programs and I am the co-host to the better podcast with my 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 dear dear friend Dr. Stephanie um what else do I do I think that's Oh, I'm an artist. Art, artist. Yeah, yeah, I love, I love creating art. I um, I started to get like these downloads about um, opening up creativity in others, and I've been doing these things that I call soul paintings, and it's just getting really in touch with myself, and then allowing it to expand on a canvas. And I really feel called and I've, and that right before COVID happened, I had started doing this, but it was doing sessions with people where we'd get a massive canvas and I would do energy work with them and some meditations and some intuitive guidance. And then we would both paint on this canvas and they would start to paint and I would go along and I kind of make sure that there's movement and, and keep opening up them up and expanding and guiding them to create this like beautiful piece of art that they can always keep. But COVID is really, <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. It's, 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 it's going to, it's going to happen. And as soon as things open back up, I want to take away, uh, find a way to, incorporate the creative creative work I do with the energy work with um with some compassion and and self-love stuff that I have yeah yeah oh that is beautiful Mm. all that energy as you're kind of coming home to yourself and doing more of what makes you happy did you ever imagine that's how your life would be (laughs) like before all that work before I guess what did you do before meeting Dr. Stephanie at the clinic. Yeah, so I had been nursing and then I had got into a relationship with with a man when we were living in Ottawa and he had always wanted to be an entrepreneur and he was working at a like a nine to five like corporate job and I was nursing and it was just a big passion of his. So I said, why don't you just, why don't you quit your job and, and start working on this business I'm making a decent money like we'll be fine and so I ended up helping him create this like very successful business but when I decided I wanted to move to California I got bought out of that part of it and it was a gift to him and you know like it was really his baby and it wasn't my passion but it was just something I helped him create so when I went to California I was just kind of living and um growing and just like being and had like a beautiful little nest egg that I had from from the business so yeah and then I came to Toronto and I had no idea what I wanted to do and I'm just like I don't know and then I woke up one day and was looking on the computer I had not been job searching whatsoever but um I was still had some money and I was still comfortable, but the girls had started to get a little bit older and they weren't around as much and they were with their friends all the time. And, 
and I just wanted a little something more. I'm like, oh, what would it be like to have a like a job again or work for someone again? And I had been painting a lot and selling my art and had been like a free bird for a couple of years. So yeah, I looked at my computer and there was this job posting. I had not been on one interview, not been looking for a job, but I was there and there was this job posting and it was written in the way that I was like, who wrote this? I need to apply. It wasn't even a job that I really wanted, but I was like, I have to apply because I need to know who wrote this. I just, I'm just feel called. So I emailed back and I, it was a job interview and it was with Dr. Stephanie and she was just looking for someone who for a couple of hours to like organize things in her home and do some like gift if she had a birthday party and needed a gift purchase I was like huh I have all the time in the world like I can do that and it was probably a month into doing that with her that she told me all about the clinic and and then we started having conversations about you know and she about the clinic and ideas that I had and she's like well, why don't you come and why don't you come and work with me in the clinic oh Okay, I've never. Yes. Okay, yes. I will yeah, do you're... It. <laughs> so... you're just answering whatever calls in your way. You're like, why not? <laughs> yeah. I swear, Jessica, I'm like, little, like, the universe just leaves me crumbs and I just, like, follow that. So I said yes. And then the day, the day that I was supposed to start in the clinic, her entire clinic burnt to the ground. Oh my God. And her car was home that day, and I, I went to her house, and I'm like, what are you doing home? You're supposed to be at the clinic. She's like, the entire clinic burned down last night. And, she, and I was like, why aren't you in bed, like, crying? She's like, because we're going to build my dream clinic. And from that moment on, we like moved into a temporary, I was full on in it. I've went from like working with her for a month to being fully in on finding a new space. And we got like a gorgeous, like 1900 square feet. And we like moved into this space and like started to like learn and create and build this like beautiful clinic. So I was just learning so much along the way. I'd never known anything about chiropractic. I didn't know anything about running a clinic. I didn't know anything about working with contractors or <laughs> starting anything like that. But we did it together and we just laughed along the way and we just fell in love with each other along yeah. the way and we just built this beautiful friendship and then she started really wanting to expand her own brand and and to um just move outside of the clinic and I was feeling the same way and I was like this was really yeah. nice I really loved my role there I loved what we were doing but there just was a call to do something else. Do something else. And that was a grief that was a grieving process. That was a hard that was a especially for her to be a part of something for so long and then to just say goodbye to it. But her partner, who is now my boss and is now the CEO of the company that I work for, he he had been a mentor to me through that whole time, but I had never thought about working for him. So after we closed the clinic, we were still going to work on, we had a nutrition, an online nutrition program at the time that was like wildly successful. And so it just so happened that Giovanni's like, hey, I'm having like a little challenge on my team right now. So I'm like, hey, I'll jump on the team. I'll help <laughs> out in addition to whatever I'm doing. And I'll just... I'll help you out in any way that I can. And I, and I did that and I was on the team and I was like, oh, I really, I really, really love this. And it kind of shifted from Dr. Stephanie being my mentor to now Giovanni being my mentor and my boss and him and I work very closely and I have so many similarities between the two of them. Yeah. So it was really nice to, to learn from Steph and, and, we were both very much in our masculine and we both learned to tap into our feminine at the same time. Mm -hmm. And, and then also work with her partner who is like one of the closest people to me. So, yeah. What a beautiful journey of growth and really not planning anything, just really yeah. listening to yourself and 
following your curiosity. You, you've had this mindset of why not? I'll try these things. Yeah. So you're also a co-host of the um, Better with Dr. Stephanie podcast, mm-hmm. and you share how daunting it was at first. Can you share a little bit about it? Why was it daunting? Well, well because th- when I started doing those quiet meditations, I started having this little voice that was like, you want, you want to share, you want to speak, you want to be seen. I was like, oh do I? Like, I don't know. I'm pretty comfortable like being behind the scenes and like not. And, and I've always had a hard time speaking up and, and saying the things that I really thought and very much people pleaser. And we get really, really, really blocked anytime conversation would come to me. I was very good at talking about other people and holding space for them. But when it came to, to talking about me, I physically could not would break out into sweats, would like, could not talk. Like if I was like, okay, voice, like talk, like it just wouldn't happen. But I started hearing that voice and I don't know who else was listening, but one day in Slack, I saw this message and it was from Dr. Stephanie and she had already started the podcast. I'd been begging her for years. I love podcasts. I listen to them all day long. They were like, they're a big part of my journey too. And I've like, learned so much from podcasts. So I was just like telling her like, you need to start one. You'd be so great. I love listening to you. So she had started one and it was going so well, but I saw that message in Slack and she's like, Hey, I want to start doing these, ask me anything or these additional episodes. I think it would be so great if you were my co-host. Everything was like, no, red alert. No, no. Like, sirens blaring like no but there was this little oh this little voice (laughs) that spoke up and was like yes you're not you don't feel ready that's okay you can you will grow so I just like wrote back and I was like yes I don't remember recording the first episode that we did. I don't even know if I spoke on the episode. No, I did speak, but I did like, and I'll, and, and I recorded it and I felt so sick after I recorded that episode. I imagined like the most horrible podcast episode that could ever be created. That's what I thought I had done. And I was anxious, you know, when you're reliving like, oh, I shouldn't have said that, or I should have said this. That was me for every night. I was sick. I was anxious. I had, my stomach was burning. I was dreading this podcast being released, (laughs) but not telling anybody. Like I was like, oh, I'm just going to keep this to myself. But it was so terrible. And then finally the day the podcast came out. I can't, I can't listen to this. I can't hear it. I I can't like, what am I going to do? She's just, she's not going to want me as her co-host. Like I was probably terrible. And I found the courage and I thought, okay, what do all the best pro athletes do? Right. They watch the tapes. You have to watch your own tapes. It's the only way to get better. So if you really want this stuff, you have to listen to it because it's the only way you will see where you want to improve on. So yeah. I went for a walk and I pushed play and like, <laughs> wasn't even 1% as bad as I had like built it up in my head, not even close, but I saw the areas that I could improve on and I saw where I was holding back. So with each episode now, I just like, I can hear my expansion and every time that I'm on and speaking up and answering my own questions and just being my more myself while also actively working on my throat chakra. It's been one that was really challenging for me. Um, so it's, it's been a very necessary part of my process, but there were moments that were, that are so painful and like vulnerability hangovers and like, yeah, yeah, but it's been the best. It's such a fun that now I'm like, Even before this podcast, before a podcast, I used to just be like, I got to move. I have to change my name. Like, I'm (laughs) sick. I can't. And now, before this podcast, I was like, oh, I'm going to go for a little walk. Jessica's going to ask me some lovely questions. I'm just going to tell her about 
who I am yeah. and what I do and that's it. That's how I feel now. So yeah. it's been such a beautiful process as someone who's witnessing from the outside and seeing that growth and allowing yourself to start shining. And the more you shine, the more beauty I seem like, oh, thank you for sharing because a lot of people relate to the same stories like throat chakra being blocked and all that like when you were sharing your stories I thought you were talking to me because 30 years of my life I was living a life that you know in my mind is what I wanted but also what others wanted what success was and coming back to myself when you take out all those layers it's terrifying it's terrifying when you're so used to being in the background but this voice inside of you is telling you you know, it's time to step into the light, whatever that light is for you. <laughs> You're like, no, of course not. It's like kicking and screaming and listening to myself the first time. It's like, no, no, like a yoga video. I was like, oh, I sound like this. Why do I say these things? Why do I giggle? Oh my God. And then I'm like, calm down. <laughs> Nobody notices those things. That's how you are. <laughs> yeah. Those are probably something that I watch it and go, oh, I love that about her. And we're, we're <laughs> judging it and like criticizing it. But that's what makes us unique and different. And I don't want to be a cookie cutter version of what society thinks that I should be. I, I want to be free. I just, yeah. that's what I want to be is just be free. And I just think it's an important part of being a mother too. I couldn't keep expecting them to be honest and open with me if I wasn't even being open and honest with myself. And love is such an important thing for me. Like I have this deep desire to love people and to get in really deep. Like I don't want to just love people on the surface. Like I want to get into their souls. But the only way you can do that is if you get into your own, right? Otherwise, it's just... And I didn't know how to do that. I just wasn't taught what like loving someone or being loved looked like. So it's something that I'm just really exploring and, and learning and, and learning to love myself and not think that I need to be perfect and ready before I step into something that's new. I think that's where a lot of my, even with my work with Giovanni, like I, I hit a point last year where I would just cry and be like, I want to be a leader. I want to help. I want to, when we grow the team, I want to be an inspiration. I want to nurture them. I want to lead by example. And I felt so stuck and like, oh, how do I do that? Like, what even is that? Like, I don't know. I don't think you've just realized the day that you are that, but it's like, how do I feel that way? Yeah. It's just like, did you do anything to feel into that role? <laughs> Is that the proper <laughs> English? <laughs> well, I started to work with a high performance coach, which for me was like, what? Like me, a high performer, like me investing in myself and like being like working on just who I am. And I started telling him about, about this place that I wanted to be in this in this role that I thought that I had to like, okay, what's my like five year, 10 year plan. And like, what do I want to accomplish and who do I want to be? And he really guided me towards like, you don't have to have that answer. You don't have to have that. This is the goal that I want to achieve, but you can know the parts of you that you want to get that you want to develop or that you want to work towards so that when the opportunity is there later on, you will, you will be ready for it and it will be right for you. So now I don't look at what do I want to accomplish? I look at what do, what do I want to grow and nurture that I, like, that I have? So I want to be better at holding space for people or choosing compassion in moments that I thought I couldn't or by, you know, forgiveness and letting go of resentment. So now I just like work towards the things that I want to develop and less about this mystical, magical thing that I want to achieve because you might get there and be like, oops, this was the wrong mountain to yeah. climb. <laughs> so that now I just you all my skills and gifts and um, see where that takes me. Did that help you lean into your feminine energy a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah. It really, really, really did. 
it's just when you when you get stuck in that masculine it's so easy to want to just like fix and like okay here's the problem what is the solution and you can get i got stuck on that loop but when i started tapping into the feminine energy it was more about exploring and more softness and more ease and more of a flow into where i want to go rather than like goal achievement goal achievement goal achievement so and i love the masculine like don't get me wrong i love the masculine but i'm all about like the balance and choosing when when there's a combination of them or when to tap, lean into one more than the other yeah. Was there resistance at first? Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Cause when I, I, I am so much of a like doer, do this perfectionist achiever, like a personality. And then when I moved away from my job into my own business and my own life and I'm like, am I still overworking myself? What do I do to keep, I couldn't, I think I struggle with connecting the feminine and the masculine part. I yeah. understand what flow and ease is and sometimes I could get into it, but there was this resistance that was like probably fear and my own limiting beliefs. Like, but if you stop working, like, how are you going to achieve anything? You yeah. cannot stop. You have momentum. And, and it's just like, uh. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, I felt protected and safe in the masculine, but then I thought, yes. Oh, is my feminine? It, it, is my guard up? Like, what is that? Like, is it okay? Like, will I be taken seriously? Do is, you know, I had just like fear. I thought that I wasn't protected in my feminine, but that's just, it's just not true. Yeah. yeah. How has your, has your relationship with your daughters changed as mm -hmm. you started to, I guess, shift and heal and grow as well? Yeah, it really, really, really has. And I'd go through these healing moments, especially with the throat chakra. I'd have um, a moment where I would do Reiki on myself and go back to a moment and do some healing in my throat chakra and love on myself a little bit. And like an hour later, my daughter would walk into my office and she would sit down and she would just start sharing and telling me. And it would be like almost an immediate result of whatever I was working on. I would see it reflected in them almost immediately and and so connected that when you're healing yourself you're also healing things in them or when you're expanding things in yourself you're also expanding things in them um it's a little bit of a tough age right now and even this week my my daughter is experiencing some things that are that she'll say is um i feel depressed or i feel this and because I'm her mother, she says, like, well, fix it. Like, fix me. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's an interesting place to be in where I have to say, like, I can't fix you. You are the only one who can fix yourself. I can show you things that I do. I can tell you great books that I've read. I can tell you podcasts that I've listened to. I can give you examples of things to do, but me, just because I'm your mom, like I cannot heal or fix you. I am now just a mentor who's here, who can help you and hold space for you and love you and guide you. And for her, there's still that resentment, but, but it comes from being 17 and not knowing yet that it comes from within her. And I know it so much, but yet I can't force it on her. I can't. I could just, I have to allow her to be resentful and be like, I'm mad at you because you're not fixing my emotion right now. And I have to go, okay, it's not because I'm a failure. It's not because I'm a bad mom. It's just because she just hasn't learned that lesson yet. What a have to just, yeah. beautiful gift you're giving her, but also allowing yourself to, yeah. it's harder. It's harder to not fix than to fix. Right. It's like, that's like, it's like, <laughs> I wish, I wish I could, but actually me trying to fix you or you thinking that I'm fixing you is probably delaying you learning to heal yourself. So it might be the, the, in the moment, the, 
feels like the easy solution, but it's not the most loving decision. The loving decision is actually to say, no, you have that power within you. I know you might not believe me now, but it's, it's there and it's yours and you can choose it. Yes. Just letting her be a stubborn 17 year old and being like, okay, you know, you know better. But I, I just, yeah. I can see the moment in the future when she comes back and she says, like, mommy, you were right. It was in me all this time. And I trust that that moment will happen. So even when weeks like that come up, I'm just, I trust in, I trust in her own inner, inner guidance and wisdom. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's yeah. necessary to know. I, my little sister, five years younger, she tells me things and I, I want to fix it for her. Yeah. But a part of me also knows like she needs to go through those challenges yeah. to become whoever she needs to be, just like I went through mine. But, and I see a lot of friends that are parents now and they worry about their kids and they want to do more. But the more you do, yeah. the less you allow them to explore. Yeah. And like, even with me and my spiritual practices, there were some spiritual healers or guides who, who would give me recommendations. And I thought every recommendation that someone gives me, I have to do it. And I would like pressure myself and thinking like, this was the thing, this, this is the thing that will help me. This is the thing that I need. And I'm very cautious now when I give recommendations to people, I'm like, I'm going to give you this recommendation you will know if it's the right one for you or, or not, or maybe for later. Because I think if we give people these tools and we get so much pressure on ourselves to do the thing that they told us to do, that, that we're not giving ourselves like ease or grace. So it's about learning tips and tools from other people but ultimately choosing, is this right for me? And then developing your own practice. So that's why I can't tell her, do this, this, and this. I can say, here are the things that work for me. These are the things that I know that work for others. You are empowered to choose the ones that are, that are right for you. Amen. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've ever done that, where you read a book and you're like, I must now live my life this way. Yeah, and then I push myself. I remember talking to you in one of those morning sessions that I have for a chiropractor fix. And I was like, yeah, I want to be a morning person. I hear about everyone who works at, wakes up at four in the morning, three in the morning, but I can barely wake up at seven because I'm exhausted all the time. It's not, you know, I'm healing through different ways. And you told me like the most compassionate thing. You're like, but if it doesn't work for you and you can sleep in, why not? And I was just like, <laughs> duh, but also like, why? Why did I try to like really wake up and be miserable and tired all day? <laughs> like, why did I put myself through that? Yeah, I know. We, we like, we don't listen to our bodies or just be like, maybe I should just accept this part of me. And yeah, I know. And embrace like, hey, you should... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so now, but there's also like beauty and really experimenting and believing that this will be the thing. And then I've just come to a place now where everything is information and I take it in and I say, oh, is this, do I want to do this? Yes. I'd like, to, I'd like to incorporate this into my practice. And now it's fun because once you read enough books or learn enough from certain people, you can kind of like mix and match the little tools that you have and be like, you know what, today I really need like a, an extra meditation or, or I need Reiki on this thing or I need to talk to my higher self or I need to talk to my inner child and you can just be more creative with, um, with your spiritual practices. Yeah, and to add on to what you have instead of what you don't have. Yes. Oh, I yeah. love that. I, that's like my little thing right now. I, um, I had like a thought that came to me the other day about how much I, um, how much I resented who people weren't instead of just like loving them for who they are. So if someone wasn't always the best listener, I'd just be like, oh, why can't they listen to me? Or why am I not good enough for them to listen to me? 
and, and, and you fixate that or I'd focus on that. And that would be how I saw them. This person is just not a good listener. But now I really lean into the other side and I do this with myself of like, but what else, but who are they? Let, let me just like take a picture of like exactly who they are and just love that instead of focusing on the things that they're, they're not. And I, and I do that with my, with myself. So beautiful. Thank you for sharing. It's a, it's a good tip that we can all <laughs> practice more of. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you ever see yourself getting into a pattern of like, why isn't this person doing that? Or why is this person doing this? I don't know. Just start being curious about what are they doing and, and what do you see in them and what beauty do they bring to you? So it's just more of a, a big part of my purpose is tied to compassion. So I always look for, look for the moments that I can choose compassion. I, I look for the moments I can choose compassion even when I thought I couldn't. So even in the most challenging moments where I'm just like, oh, I'm angry and oh, I don't like this and that person hurt me, I'm like, okay, what is the compassionate approach to this situation? So that's how I ground myself. It's always, what is the compassionate approach to this? That was going to be my next question. How do yes. you ground yourself? Yes. I know everyone is different, but oh, compassion. Compassion, because that, like, I just, I come back to the core of who I am. And who I am is love and compassion. So if I can get really quiet and center myself and come back to that place, it will inform how I want to proceed with anything. So that's a big part of it. For me, grounding is whenever I can, shoes off, socks off, on the earth. It's really hard in Canada during the winter. <laughs> it's like, it affects me definitely. <laughs> but grounding on the earth, I focus a lot on my root chakra and... Um, and really getting into like a deep into those meditations and feeling that safety. So that's, that's a big part of my grounding practices. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Oh, you're so welcome. Transformation. Yeah. I'm happy to share with you anytime. Oh, I wanted to wrap this up with some rapid fire questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> What's the best compliment you've ever received? Best compliment I've ever received. I think it's, I think it's the moments where someone's told me, oh, I've never shared that with anyone before, or I've never looked at that this way before. Any moment that I am a catalyst for some sort of new thought or area to explore whenever I hear one of those little cues I'm like mm, that feels really good I love I love sparking those little moments in people so that to me is like oh yeah that's such a huge compliment yeah. to be that person that sparks something in them and others and you definitely do I every time you share something I'm like so thank you <laughs> you're welcome a book that's changed your life Oh, this is probably the book that's on so many people's list, but it's The Four Agreements. And it was gifted to me at a time in my life where I could not even physically read a book and a friend gifted it to me in audio. Mm. And it was specifically the, the agreement about it's not personal because up until that time, I had never entertained the thought that what people did to me or how they were treating me or the experiences or their feelings or their emotion, I thought everything was tied to who I was. I thought it was all, if someone hurt me, it's because I'm not good enough. It's because I'm broken. It's because I'm this. When really in pretty every case, it's not personal. It's not even about you. It is completely about them. And even just that new idea sparking in me allowed me to start seeing myself in a different, in a different way and, and recognizing those moments where, 
oh, this person is acting this way, but it's not because of me. It's something to do with them. And that opens up a lot of compassion. So beautiful. You brought tears in my eyes. Thank you for sharing that book. I'm adding it to the show notes. Oh, you haven't read it? Oh my gosh. You have to read the four I haven't read it yet. So it's good. in my to read list. Like it's oh. always growing, but it, it's moving up now. <laughs> oh yeah. It's fantastic. It's so good. I recommend it all the time. I'm sharing it. I think more people will read it too. <laughs> what does coming home to yourself mean? That's a really great question. Coming home to myself. It's funny because I spent so much of my life like searching for home or what is home or where is home or what is that magical place and and I'm now in a place where it's available to me at all times because I simply just need to close my eyes even for a set like I feel home within me yes. and it's there when I need it. And, and when I get disconnected from it, like I can just choose to feel at home in, in myself and that it's, it's just, it's just trust in trust in myself and loving myself and being, allowing myself to be perfectly imperfect. What would you like to have more of? More of. Mm. Okay. I love art so much, but I am deeply, deeply energized by seeing the art of others. And in Toronto, I have like annual passes to all of the art museums. And right now, because everything is closed and because I'm not able to access and it, because it used to be part of my week where I would just go to the AGO and walk around and sometimes I do the whole thing and sometimes I just go see my favorite piece and just share a moment with it and I and I don't have that anymore and I haven't yeah. had that for a while but I get really really inspired and and creative and energized by the work of others so I'm really missing I mean I love my own art I'm gonna I'm like praise <laughs> I love it but the art of others can just open up things that that are beautiful. beautiful. Oh. Advice. Ooh, maybe people can tag you in their artwork. <laughs> oh, I would love that. I would love that. I mean, I've tried. I've like done like those virtual like look arounds of museums. Yeah. This is something that's not, you know how Zoom. You're like this is great connection, but it's but not it's not the same as like having someone in front of you. Totally. <laughs> But any art, oh, I'll tag me in it. I love art. Love <laughs> she'll love she'll it. receive that energy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Advice for your younger self? Ah, oh. I don't think I have any advice for her anymore. I go back and I visit her often, but I just, I I no longer have advice. I only have the words that I needed to hear at that time. So it's just, thank you. I see you. I love you. You're trying so hard. You're doing such a good job. I'm so proud of you. Like those are the things that I would go back and tell my, tell my younger self, my past yeah. self. And I go back and I tell it, but I don't know. I'm really happy with where I am. So I'm like, don't worry, kiddo. We we're you didn't. You're gonna do well. We're doing really yeah. well in life. So like, just keep keep doing and I appreciate every step along the way so no advice only love for her yeah. finally where can people find you oh they can find me my website is majormagic.ca my instagram is steffi k major m-a-j-o-r yeah those are the places you can find me. those are places what are some of your offerings and programs yeah so I do a um a Reiki plus intuitive guide um, that is on my website. You can find it there. It's the, it's in the let's make magic section right now. I'm doing distance Reiki. So available to anyone anywhere in the world. 
and I do that. And then right now I'm developing a program. Um, it's an eight week program. It's not quite ready yet, but it's going to be, I do these things that I call dates with God. And I also take each chakra on a date when it's needed. Mm -hmm. So I'm putting together this whole package on teaching people how to do that. And it's, it's just like a very, anyone who's really interested in creative ways to expand or to love yourself or to spend time with yourself or to um, open up things in you. It, it's all based on that. So I've just been in the lab right now developing this, this, and I'm really excited. It's just going to take a little bit more time, but yeah. Oh, May please right now. let me know. Let I me will. know when it comes I out. Will. Yeah. I would love to share it. Uh, question for distance Reiki. Is it something you can gift to someone else? Even if they're not aware of your energy? Yeah. No, for me, ethically, I only do sessions with people where I have permission. And in fact, there are sessions that I've done with people where if I get an energetic no, um, I won't proceed. If, if someone might be like, yes, I want one. But if I, I'm very intentional with who I work with and it has to, I don't just have a let's book a session on my website. It's, it's hyper, hyper intelligent, intentional because everyone deserves the right Reiki practitioner for them. So I like to make sure that it's an energetic match and that I'm the right person to facilitate it. So I'm really, really intentional with it. And, um, only, only when the person is aware well, and that they know I have little people that I like send Reiki to and like my like prayer, like list and stuff, yeah, but, yeah. but not full Reiki session. Yeah. Uh, that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> that's just how I choose to do it because I just think that people need to just to be open to receive and a, it's a very personal private thing to let someone into your energy field and. I would just want to give someone else permission. So I do the same yeah. with others. I've been asked before, like, hey, do you think you can send like my brother-in-law Reiki? Yeah. He really needs it. I will pay you. And I'm like, oh. oh. They have to be open to receiving. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be oh. ready and it has to be the right time and something that you're choosing. Doesn't mean you have to be fully open and be trust, but at least have, give yourself permission to the experience. Mm. This is like a full circle of the conversation where I started by saying thank you for sending the gift and I'm learning to receive <laughs> oh my gosh this is such a beautiful conversation thank you so much for allowing me to share the things about me I look forward to listening to all of your episodes I'm so proud of you this is such a wonderful journey for you, you and I'm just so excited Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review on iTunes. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.